So perhaps, for some of you, this is not new information about me, but I think it's worth sharing. My brothers and I were raised in the church. My parents had us in the church all the time. And by all the time, I mean, if the church doors were open, we were there. If the church doors were not open, we were there waiting in the parking lot until somebody would open the church doors so that we could be there. Now, mind you, you know that my dad is a pastor, but this is not when dad was a pastor. This was before he went to seminary. This was before dad and I went to seminary together. So as lay people, my parents had my brothers and I at the church all the time. Throughout my formative years, I remember being at the church often. We were there for vacation Bible school, for children's choir. We were there when Dad would go to choir practice and Mom would go to Bible study or would volunteer in the church office. We were there as teenagers for youth group or for the youth choir. And the understanding was, and perhaps you can relate to this, the understanding was, if we wanted to do anything else during the week, first, we were at church. And not just Sunday morning, not just Sunday school, not just worship. We were there all the time if we wanted to do anything else. Now, my home church is First Church in Chambersburg. And First Church in Chambersburg took seriously the covenant that was made in my baptism. Now, First Church Chambersburg isn't the church that baptized me. They received me as a child already having been baptized by another faith community. When my family moved to Fayetteville, we found ourselves at First Church Chambersburg. And when my brothers and I were growing up there, the people at First Church followed through with the covenant that the church in Lebanon had made. That I would be raised in faith. That the church would surround my parents and help them raise me in faith. And so my home church, they did just that. Honestly, it seemed that as children and teenagers, we were at the church sometimes more often than our own home, to the point that church really felt like home. Now, do you have the same experience that I do, that sometimes there are certain smells that conjure particular memories Certain smells that, while they might not be describable with words, you know it's a smell that you know. And and not those bad smells that you smell and think, oh my goodness, make that one go away. But the the smells that, that bring us some kind of comfort. My home church smells like that. My home church has a particular smell to it, a particular scent. And after I had left the church and had begun serving my own churches, serving under appointment, I had come back home for a service, for a meeting, for something. And when I went into the church, it smelled just like home. There was something really special and powerful about that. That even though I left, when I came back, it still smelled like a familiar place. Like a place where I belonged. Thinking about the scent of my home church reminds me of a visit that I was making with a parishioner in one of the churches where I served. The woman that I was visiting with was a saint. She was a woman of deep faith, and she knew that she was dying, and she was okay with that. And one day when she was in the hospital after surgery, I went in to visit her, and she reached up her long arm to me and grabbed me by my collar and pulled me down to her bed. And she breathed deeply, saying that she wanted to smell the church on me. There are sounds and scents and feelings that draw us in and make us feel like we're at home. Can you smell them? Can you imagine them? Now, the church is that place for me. My family and my home church taught me about faith. 
They raised me in faith and modeled faith for me, and they gave me every opportunity so that I could grow in my relationship with Christ. And so for me, church has always been home. Now, Anne Lamont tells this story in her book, Traveling Mercies. She says, I think my son and I have missed church ten times in twelve years. A few years ago, a tall African-American woman named Veronica came to lead us. She had huge, gentle doctor hands with dimples where the knuckles should be, like baby's fists. She stepped into us, the wonderful old worn pair of pants that is St. Andrew, and they fit. She sings to us sometimes from the pulpit and tells us stories of when she was a child. She told us this story just the other day. When she was about seven, her best friend got lost one day. The little girl ran up and down the streets of the town where they lived, but she couldn't find a single landmark. She was very frightened. Finally, a policeman stopped to help her. He put her in the passenger seat of her car, of his car, and drove her around until she finally saw her church. She pointed it out to the policeman and she told him firmly, you can let me out now. This is my church and I can always find my way home from here. And that's why, Anne Lamont goes on to say, I've always stayed so close to mine. Because no matter how bad I am feeling, how lost or lonely or frightened, when I see the faces of the people at my church and I hear their tawny voices, I can always find my way home. This is a beautiful story. This is a story of Anne Lamont's that I love. And it's one to which I can relate. Church feels like home. And from there, I can always find my way home. But the story makes me wonder. (coughs) Often do we feel lost. How often are we the little girl in the story and we don't know how to find our way home. And what about all of those persons around us who feel lost? How can we, how can they find their way back home? Find their way back to the church? Now, I don't need to share statistics with us regarding the numbers of unchurched persons in our neighborhoods, which is roughly half. And I don't need to remind us of what the studies say about why unchurched people aren't so excited to go to church. However, hear this brief glimpse of our reputation. David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons in their book Unchristian wrote that 87% of young adults who are not involved in the church described Christians as judgmental. And 85% of that same group, young adults not in the church, described Christians as hypocritical. So judgmental and hypocritical, that doesn't sound like home to me. That doesn't sound like the type of home that I want. And absolutely, that should not be the church. It simply is not biblical. Now, from the message, we can read an example of what maybe the church is to look like. So this is in the message, and this these are some selected verses from Ephesians 4, which says, And so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. But that's no life for you. You learned Christ. Take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces God's character in you. What this adds up to then is this. No more lies, 
No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we are all connected to each other. When you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. That's the biblical mandate. Having learned Christ, living a God-fashioned life, recognizing that we are all part of Christ's body in which we are all connected to each other, being gentle and sensitive with one another and thoroughly forgiving one another. That's the church or what the church is to be. And it sounds like the type of home that I would like to have. I want us to look for a moment at the scriptures that you heard my parents read this afternoon. Now, I have to confess, I'm just naturally drawn to the book of Jeremiah, especially the 29th chapter. And at this point in the Israelite story, they're in exile in Babylon. And they've received this letter, this message from God in this place that is not their home. God instructs them. Build houses and make themselves as home. Plant gardens and live off of those gardens. Marry, have children, and encourage the children to marry. Again, the letter says that these exiles are to make themselves at home there. They're to work for the country's welfare and pray for the welfare of Babylon. Pray for the welfare of this place that is not home. So twice. Twice in these few verses, the Israelites are instructed to make their home right where they are. The prophet continues by offering a word of hope from God who says, I have it all planned out, plans to take care of you, not abandon you, plans to give you the future that you hope for. And as this section of scripture comes to an end, God decrees that God will bring home the Israelites from this place of exile. When home isn't home, when church isn't home, how does it become home? How does the church become the place where we go? Make ourselves at home there, and then always be able to find our way back home from there. How do we do that? How is that possible? The Revelation scripture speaks to that. The scripture in Revelation said God has moved into the neighborhood, making God's home with men and women. The church is the place where God has already made God's home. When the church isn't the place where we feel like home. God has already moved into the neighborhood. Having learned Christ, living a God-fashioned life, recognizing that we are all part of Christ's body in which we are all connected to each other, being gentle and sensitive with one another and thoroughly forgiving one another. When we live like that, when we live up to this biblical call, then the church becomes home for all of those for whom home is necessary. God has already moved into the neighborhood. Is that something that we believe? And if it is, how does that affect how we live? How does that affect how we make the church a place that feels like home and a place from which we can always find our way home? I think one of the challenges that we have is to own this reality. Glenn McDonald makes this statement in his book, Disciple Making Church. He says that the church is the only organization that exists for its non-members. Hear that again. The church is the only organization 
that exists for its non-members. So then, church isn't about us. Church isn't about making ourselves comfortable. Church isn't about meeting my needs and your needs. Church isn't about making sure that we're happy. Rather, church is about our neighbors who don't yet know Christ. Church is the place where we do our part to fulfill the Great Commission, where we are disciples who make disciples. Now, don't get me wrong. We need the church. We need the community of faith so that we can grow, so that we can deepen our relationship with Christ, so that we can have opportunities to grow and be challenged. But church doesn't stop there. Church cannot stop there. We must go beyond nurturing and caring only for ourselves and find ourselves living into the Great Commission, being disciples who make disciples of others for those more than half of the people in our neighborhoods who don't yet know Christ. In Acts 1, before Jesus ascends into heaven, he says to his followers, you will be able to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all over Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the world. And as the scripture continues, Jesus ascends into heaven. And the disciples are standing around looking at the sky. And these two men appear and they address the disciples. Now, I need to confess, the next scripture is not from the message, it's not from the Living Bible, it's not from a regular translation, this is mine. My interpretation is that the instruction from these men to the disciples is, fellas, why in the world are you standing around staring off into the sky? You've got work to do. And that's the same instruction for the church today. We've got work to do. Why are we standing around? Persons in our communities are not going to come into our churches just because we're there, just because we exist. And we have to remember that we exist not to take care of ourselves, but we exist to do our job to fulfill our mission to be disciples who make disciples of others. God has moved into the neighborhood. Even when we don't feel like we're at home, God has instructed us that we make ourselves at home right here, trusting that God has a plan to take care of us and to give us the future for which we hope. Now, for me, church has always been my home. I don't know what it's like for the church to not be home. And for me, I can always find my way home from here. But friends, there are so many among us, so many in our neighborhood, who don't know that God has moved into the neighborhood. And our job is to be those disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ, of all of those persons who haven't yet found their way home. And so it is my hope and prayer that as we journey together in this new Altoona district, that we are able to come alongside all of those persons in our neighborhoods who do not yet have a home with Christ, who do not yet have home with the church, a home with God, and a way to help them find their way home, knowing that God has already moved into the neighborhood. And so, brothers and sisters, as we begin this journey together, My hope and prayer is that we can covenant to one another to do our job, to be disciples who make disciples of others, and all of those persons in our neighborhood who don't yet know that God is there will be able to come home with us. Amen.